I'm sure the comments on this are going to be great. Hello and welcome to or back to my channel. I'm Kit and today, per request, we're going to take a look at one of Better Bachelor's videos. Before we get into it, I would like to note that I don't know Joker and these are my thoughts and opinions on the content he puts out for public consumption. That being said, thank you for clicking on this video and I would like to give extra thanks to my patrons. Links to my socials and Patreon are below along with sources and resources. And now onto the reason we're all here. In May, I got a link to this video and a just wondering your reaction. And my reaction, well, I clicked the link. I saw the image. He treated me too well, so I turned him into a feminist. My eyebrows furrowed in confusion and figuring we were watching a video or reading an article, I checked the description box for a link. Finding nothing, I returned to the video and clicked to a point that displayed the article and then I Googled it. I read the article, which is actually titled, My Husband Treated Me Like a Queen and It Made Me Miserable. And then I thought, oh no, as I guessed how Bachelor took this article. And that was my reaction. But since we're here, let's have a look at the video. And thank you to whoever sent this in as it gives me an excuse to run my experiment. And if you're wondering what I'm talking about, please stay to the end of the video. It's been over two years since my last Better Bachelor video, so let's refresh the memory. Per his YouTube bio, Better Bachelor is a channel for open-minded men and women if so inclined, to talk about current events, news, opinions, humor, and ways to better yourself and find happiness and understanding in today's society. This is an open forum where comments, talking points, concerns, and discussion about topics are encouraged. Most content is focused towards single men's issues, but may be applicable to others. I focus on viewing many issues from multiple or underrepresented angles. Okay, so before we get into the video, we should probably read the article. I'm twisting around to look at my ass in the mirror. My crack stretches up beyond the top of the tiny bikini my husband has just gifted me, and my cheeks peek out from the bottom. I study the pale flesh spilling out of both ends of my new suit and wonder how I could ever wear this to our son's swim meet or a family vacation. He grins big and says, baby, it's perfect. You're hot. I feel flattered that my bleavage turns him on, and then, immediately, anxious that he's horny and it's my responsibility to take care of it. A sex clock starts ticking down in my head, knowing how pout if too much time passes before he gets the intimacy he craves. When we turn in for the night, hours later, there's a will-they-won't-they they tension pinning me to the bed. I hope there is some amount of stillness that says, no thank you, without me having to actually say it. I dread the passive-aggressive pressure far more than I've ever dreaded sex. The next day, he huffs and puffs in the kitchen. He slams the cabinet and offers only one-word answers. This was a story of my life with my husband for the first decade of our marriage. The gifts and flattery were part of a cycle that came with unspoken obligations and micro-blaming when I didn't meet them. It was a theme across our entire relationship, not just with regard to sex. He made lavish meals and then stared at me while I took my first bite. I found myself overperforming my pleasure with the food to validate him. He'd ask repeatedly if I liked it when my performances failed to convince him. We had an implicit agreement that I was responsible for his emotional state, and it was exhausting me. Admitting to myself that our dynamic was toxic was the catalyst I needed to push us both into therapy, where we could unpack and challenge all the nonsense our families of origin had modeled. I was raised in a Southern conservative family with strict gender roles. I was expected to brush my hair, tuck in my shirt, and worship the men around me. There was no real sex education at home or at school, but I basically earned a master's in what is expected of a woman. My mother was chronically responsible for my father's emotional state, in addition to most of the housework and a full-time job. There were no healthy, mutual partnerships in my husband's upbringing either. His father was always in charge, even if he didn't know what he was talking about, and he brutally dominated the family and any business contacts who crossed his path. As one of four boys, my husband learned to revere female anatomy, but not to understand it. In therapy, we started to see our conditioning more clearly. We learned we are each responsible for determining and communicating what we want and for giving the other person the compassion and space to do the same. My husband learned to take everything less personally and to manage his feelings of rejection with a bit more grace. We still work in therapy to untangle our codependent patterns and take responsibility for ourselves. This new perspective allowed me to step into a leadership role in our life and home. I realized I wanted true equal partnership, so I started to assert myself and worry less about his response. My husband had to relearn his beliefs about leadership too and to accept how important it is to also be an enthusiastic follower. Our new healthier marriage requires that I confront him regularly and elbow my perspective onto the table for consideration since we were both raised to prioritize only his. It was during one of these 
pivotal confrontations when I accidentally sparked the best thing that ever happened to our sex life. We occasionally read nonfiction books at the same time, book club style, and one day I confronted him about his recommendations. I complained that he was in an echo chamber of white men who don't acknowledge patriarchy, white supremacy, or the privilege they receive from those systems. I couldn't get past the ignorance to receive the lessons of the books, I told him. And holy shit, he listened. His next book recommendation was Emily Nagoski's Come As You Are, and I was so excited that he was suggesting a patriarchy smashing author I didn't even mind the book was about sex. Turns out, feeling heard is a bit of a turn on for me. Who knew? Nagoski's book demystifies intimacy and genitalia and makes a very strong case that we all have the same parts organized in different ways. The author makes this point so often that the reader really can't help but feel deeply connected to every other body on the planet with each turn of the page. This flat and dark confusing hierarchy where I was desired but objectified and made us equal at last. What a relief to dismantle that pedestal he had me on. I never really felt safe up there. The next thing he did was plan an entire date around the book. He owned the project of incorporating the information into our life and his emotional labor felt like love to me in a way my drawer full of slutty bikinis didn't. He read and recommended the book and invited me to a scheduled date on my calendar which might not sound sexy, but it feels like steaming hot consent to me. He completed the accompanying worksheets, set up activities, and led the conversation to discover our most mutually pleasing sexual context as the book recommends. Nagoski describes sexual context as all the things happening around and inside the people having the sexual experience. Each person's mental state, the relationship dynamics, and little details like the temperature of the room and the scent of a candle all make up the context. My husband and I have been putting too much pressure on the act and not enough focus on all the other things going on around it. Our cat and mouse dynamic was giving me anxiety and making him resentful, so our mental states were not ready for pleasure. As we worked through that big foundational dynamic with our counselor, we started experimenting with the setting details. We learned to set up a space heater and make a bed by the fireplace because I need heat. We went on a date to mix up our own salty tropical scent so we could be reminded of sexy vacations. We kept the practice of scheduling connection time so I get a chance to look ahead on my calendar and crave our date nights and their happy endings. Co-creating a sexual context was fun and helped remind us that mutual pleasure is the only goal. Our optimal context honors our individual preferences while casting us in an act where we are utterly equal. I know honorable men everywhere are treating women like sex goddesses and queens, but I'm pretty sure that misses the point. If the goal is a reciprocal, sexy partnership, no one really needs the royal treatment. I'm grateful to have learned it was actually standing in the way of what my husband and I really want. I'm not a queen or a goddess. I'm a person with a body and so is he. We have so much more pleasure when we acknowledge that. So the man would do things that he expected would lead to sex and he was resentful when he didn't receive it. And the woman felt anxious about it. This led to them going to therapy and having breakthroughs in their relationship where they worked through the patriarchal nonsense their family dynamics put on them to perform. And as a result, they have a healthier, happier marriage. I don't see the problem, but I have a feeling I know what Bachelor is going to say. And on that note, let's take a moment to appreciate that a few days after posting this video, Bachelor posted a video about how lonely, sad, unloved married men are the main users of OnlyFans. So what exactly are men supposed to do? I guess we'll find out. We'll skip over the intro where Bachelor poisons the well by reminding his audience what women are really like. Apparently, we want to turn our husbands into docile submissives so we can cheat on them with a gym bro. And then we're off. When I first saw this, this is from HuffPost, which of course is the toilet bowl of, of the internet, but this is by a Holly Terry. And Holly Terry writes from the standpoint of a feminist. And that's why I wanna read this. Sometimes I want to ask, is the feminism in the room with us? But I suspect that women wanting to be respected on the basis of being human instead of being seen as a sex object is what makes a woman a feminist. You could think women have their role and men have theirs. There are things women do and things men do and never the twain shall meet. But if you ever object to how a man views a woman, to bachelor and friends, you are a feminist. To let you know that if you give the opportunity for a woman to take your your huevos, your eggs in her hand, she can and possibly will lop them off uh, at any point in time. Uh, this is from HuffPost Personal. My husband treated me like a queen and it made me miserable. I know honorable men everywhere are treating women like goddesses and queens, but I'm pretty sure that misses the point. So by treating a woman you know, women say, oh, we want men to be emotional. We want them to be connected with their feelings. We want them to respect us. They want us to love us. This guy does. And she says, other men, I know other honorable men are doing this everywhere, but you're missing the point. As this video was published, I suspect Bachelor is going to miss the point as well. That's all right, though. I'm here to help.
Anyway, he shows us the picture in the article and then moves on to the article itself. He says, I'm twisting around to look at my, my butt in the mirror. My crack stretches up beyond the top of the tiny bikini my husband just gifted me and my cheeks peek out from the bottom. I study the skin spilling out of both ends of my new suit and wonder how I could ever wear this to our son's swim meet or a family vacation. He says he grins a big grin and says, baby, it's perfect. You're hot. Now, this is the guy and this is her. This is the woman writing this. This is the woman talking about herself and her husband. This is a good looking guy. You know, he's getting up to his salt and pepper years. She's seen better days, I guarantee you. Please tell me this isn't a, you're getting older, so be grateful your husband wants to have sex with you instead of finding a younger woman. But he's saying, you know something, you're hot. I want you to wear this little skimpy thing because, hey, it turns me on a little bit. She says, I feel flattered that my believage turns him on. And then immediately I'm anxious that he's worked up and it's my responsibility to take care of it. A sex clock starts ticking down in my head. I know he'll pout too much if time passes before he gets the intimacy he craves. So he gives her a little tiny bikini. He says, man, you're looking good in that baby. And she gets anxious that he might be getting turned on by her and that he wants to sleep with her. See, from the male's perspective, it's, I gave you this little tiny bikini. I think you're hot in it. Man, I, you know, I love your body. I still love you. How about, uh, you know, we go up to the bedroom, a little something, something you know what I mean? Yeah, because I care about you and I love you and I think you're hot. What's her angle? Oh, no. He wants to sleep with me. Ugh. Ugh. He did this because he wants to sleep with me. How do you make those two, how do you make those two things connect? It's actually really easy and the author will explain in a moment, but just in case anyone misses it, this is a recurring theme in their relationship. She says, when we turn in for the night hours later, there's a will, uh, there's a will they, won't they tension pinning me into the bed. I hope there's some amount of stillness that says no thank you without me having actually to say it. I dread the passive aggressive pressure far more than I've ever dreaded sleeping with him. The next day, he huffs and puffs in the kitchen. He slams the cabinet and offers only one word answers. Now, okay, ladies, uh, will you take me out to dinner here? No, I'm not in the mood. No, thank you. Can we go to this event? No, I don't feel like it. Will, can, can we redo the kitchen? No. Can you fix my car? No, I don't feel like it. Would she huff and puff? Would she have attitude? Would she get angry? Oh, you betcha. Because next thing you know, you're sitting down having the the face to face about how you're not holding your weight up as a husband, how you're not pulling your weight in the relationship because you didn't help her with the laundry or you didn't take her to dinner or you don't get her things that she likes or you don't pay attention or you don't whatever, blah, 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 blah. There is a big difference between slacking on household chores or declining events and not having sex. Married or not, no one is owed someone else's body. And since people tend to assume I'm only talking to women, that goes for everyone. Your sex or gender, sexual orientation, marital status, no one is owed another person's body. You do not exist for someone else's pleasure. And the person asking should understand that. But when the one thing a guy says is, hey, you know something? I got a little, I got a little something, something, little tension going on here. I'd like to relieve my pressure and I'd like to do it with my beautiful wife. And she's like, ew, get away from me. I hate to spoil this for everyone, but fun fact, rather than continue the PA behavior on both their parts, they actually unpacked it and now communicate with one another and have good sex. It's really weird that Bachelor is arguing for the status quo, which neither of them were happy with. Too many times relationships turn into this where the woman says, I'm not going to fulfill my wifely duties, but you still need to fulfill your husbandly duties. I would like an example of what these wifely and husbandly duties are and why they apparently differ. And then this is the woman that takes that guy to court and takes him for every dime she can when he decides to go out and find a, a smoking hot 24 year old to relieve his miseries. Because I can tell you right now, if this guy's on a, on a, a babe site, or a dating site, and he says, just looking just looking for a little fun. There are, are plenty of younger women that'd be like, yeah, he's not a bad looking older guy. I'll go have a little fun with him. So 
Whether you want to or not, you should have sex with your husband or he'll cheat. I don't know who needs to hear this, but coercion is not consent. She says, this was the story of my life with my husband for the first decade of our marriage. The gifts and the flattery were part of a cycle that came with unspoken obligations and micro blaming when I didn't meet them. It was a theme across our entire relationship, not just with regards to the bedroom. So him giving gifts and flattery, she thinks were bribes to sleep with her. Now, either A, no, he loved you. He wanted to make you happy. He was trying to get you in a good, happy mindset so that maybe you would want to sleep with him, that you would want to be intimate with him. Maybe that you would give him the thing that he actually wants from you. You know, if you have open, honest communication, you don't need to bribe your partner with gifts or hope a gift makes them happy enough to have sex. You can just ask. Or B, he knew you were so disinterested in him and sleeping with him that instead of cheating or going out and doing something wrong, he said, I'm, I'll like, let me try to do something here that makes things work for both of us. But the way she words this, it makes it sound like he's just, well, he's giving me gifts and being flattering because he wants to sleep with me. Okay, so maybe he loves you. Maybe he finds you attractive. I don't think him finding her attractive was the problem, and if you love someone, you should have no problem talking to them. This was a problem on both ends. She should have told him how she felt about the gifts and the expectations around them, and he should have told her how he felt having his advances rejected, instead of them both tiptoeing around the subject. Of course, this only applies if both have open ears, which these two obviously did. Someone just had to be the first. He made lavish meals and then stared at me while I took my first bite. I found myself overperforming my pleasure with the food to validate him. He'd ask repeatedly if I liked it when my performance failed to convince him. We had an implicit agreement that I was responsible for his emotional state and it was exhausting to me. Now, is it possible that he did need too much validation from her? Yes, it is. But isn't that what women, and especially these feminists, isn't that what they say they want? I want to be validated. I want to feel safe. I want to feel important. I want to feel loved. Okay, here's all the things. Oh, you're smothering me. No, women in general, and definitely not feminists, don't want men to seek validation from women. What we want from men is basic human respect, not a pedestal. And, and women will never understand the fine line it is to be a man to try to do this, which is why a lot of guys say, you know what? It's impossible. I'm not going to try anymore. I'm the man in the relationship. If you don't like that, leave. Women are forcing men to turn into the monsters they hate them to, to be. Because when men do try, they get shut down. When men do try, they get insulted. If you try to open up to someone and they mock or insult you for it, that person is not a good person and that relationship might have run its course. Bachelor is acting as though asking men to recognize women's humanity is an impossible ask and I don't understand why. Unless it's to inform his audience that women should never ask for anything from men, we should take what we're given. And no, if you become a monster, that's not someone else's fault. And then, and then on top of that, on top of that, she turns around and goes back to the the, the guy that treated her awful. I have no doubt that that has happened, but I doubt it did for reasons Bachelor thinks. And again, women are human. One woman or 10 women or even a million women doesn't represent the 3.95 billion women currently on earth. And I've got something I'll share when it comes to that after this story. She said, admitting to myself that our dynamic was toxic was the catalyst I needed to push us both into therapy where we could unpack and challenge all the nonsense our families of origin had modeled. I was raised in a Southern conservative family with strict gender roles. I was expected to brush my hair, tuck in my shirt, and worship the men around me. Do you hear the poison in her, vo in her voice? Look, I know plenty of people from the South. The women aren't taught to worship men around them. They're taught to respect men. Why is he trying to invalidate her experience? 
Maybe Bachelor isn't familiar with religion, but across denominations, a recurring theme is how the order is God, man, woman, children. And that respect women are supposed to show men sure looks a whole lot like worship. And interestingly, girls aren't taught to respect women or that they also deserve that respect. I'll link some books below if anyone would like to read further. But for a lot of feminists, just respecting a man, they think is poisonous. They think that that is toxic to even, to even respect a man. I respect plenty of men because of who they are, not because they are men. She said there was no real education at home or at the school about the bedroom, but I basically earned a master's in what is expected of a woman. My mother was chronically responsible for my, my father's emotional state in addition to most of the houseworking and a full-time job. So again, mother, pedestal, father, horrible person. She's not putting her mother on a pedestal and saying her father was horrible. Bachelor is putting words on that page that she did not write. There was no healthy mutual partnerships in my husband's upbringing. Uh, his father was always in charge, even if he didn't know what he was talking about, and he brutally dominated the family and any business contacts who crossed his path. As one of our boys, my as one of four boys, my husband learned to revere fa uh, female anatomy, but not to understand it. Notice how at the angle she's writing this from. Every man so far in this is bad, toxic, punishing, brutal, dominating. You can hear it in the words that she uses. To me, the angle she's coming at this from is, we did this, but we didn't know any better. And then we learned better and now things are better. You can perpetuate toxic behaviors without knowing it. And if you want, you can also change them. Also, she's only speaking of three men in this article, her husband, father, and father-in-law. Nowhere does she say this is all men everywhere, nor does she attribute malice to men who put women on pedestals. She has a very unhealthy respect for men. That sounds as though Bachelor thinks she respects men too much, but I don't think that's what he meant. But yet you notice her husband isn't brutal or dominating or no, he's kind and giving. She says, uh, in therapy, we started to see our condition more clearly. We learned we are each responsible for determining and communicating what we want and for giving the other person the compassion and space to do the same. Oh boy, she needs space. We know what that turns into. My husband learned to take everything less personally and to manage his feelings of rejection with a bit more grace. We still work in therapy to untangle our codependent patterns and to take our responsibility for ourselves. Notice she explains what he had to do, but not what she learned. She didn't really learn anything, it sounds like. She's actually about to say what she's learned, but he's not reading this article in good faith, so it won't be to his liking. This new perspective allowed me to step into a leadership role in our life and our home. And there it is. There it is. That's it right there. She couldn't stand a man being her equal or better than her and doing things for her. She had to be in charge. And that's what's happening with all these women today. Called it. It would do Bachelor well to realize that not everyone has his upbringing, his experience, especially women. And anytime a woman finds her voice and realizes that she's a person too, she's allowed to not like something and to have expectations, these fellows will always object because they're lazy. They don't want to have to do the work. They just want women to shut up and take whatever they get. And by the way, when you're not used to having a voice, it is not suddenly this wonderful freedom. It's scary to speak up for yourself when you're not used to it. And if you don't understand that, that's fine, but don't do what Bachelor is doing. That they want men to be, oh, we need to be equals. Okay, I'll be your equal. I'll also do these nice things for you. I'll cook for you. Do you like it? I hope you like it. Oh, that's too much. I bought you this cute little outfit because I find you beautiful and attractive and I want to sleep with you later. Oh, that's problematic. Yes. If you do things with the expectation of a reward, that is problematic. It's also not doing nice things. If I give Natalie a present and then expect her to give me $20, or I give Michael a Speedo because I think he's hot and I want to have sex, that's not being nice, that's not being a good person. That's putting a burden on someone that, one, they didn't ask for, and two, they might not have accepted if they knew their were conditions. But right here it is. This is the giveaway. The new perspective allowed me to step into a leadership role. I realized I wanted true equal partnership. She did, but she didn't. 
but based on the sentence before it. If there are two people in a relationship with one another, they should both be leaders of that relationship. That is equality, not one person being the leader and the other being submissive. So I started to assert myself and worry less about his response. My husband had to relearn his beliefs about leadership too and accept how important it is to also be an enthusiastic follower. Shut up, get in the back seat. It's my time. It's my time. That's not what she's saying. She's saying that everything isn't his decision alone, not that he's now in the back seat and she's doing all the driving. So he loved her, he doted on her, and she says, shut up in the back seat. You're toxic. She says, our new healthier marriage requires that I confront him regularly and elbow my perspective onto the table for his consideration since we both failed to realize to prioritize only his. It was during one of these pivotal confrontations when I accidentally sparked the best thing that has ever happened to our bedroom life. She confronts him regularly, and, and now you understand why so many men say, I'm out. She gets in his face and she confronts him. Confront does sound argumentative, but it also means present to someone so that dealing with it cannot be avoided. I highly doubt they're having screaming matches, but I probably have a higher opinion of people than Bachelor does of women. Do guys want an argumentative wife? Do guys want a headache? Do guys want the arguments? No. And so what do men do that want to keep the bedroom and keep the marriage and keep half their assets and keep the kids? What do they do? They go, oh, fine, fine. Happy wife, happy life. I'm just going to shut up and you can run the show, honey. Okay, honey. Oh, uh, you bet, honey. Yes, dear. Of course, honey. Henpecked. From the sounds of it, they didn't have much of a bedroom to keep, but already. She says we occasionally occasionally read nonfiction books at the same time, book clubs, club style. For my listeners, that was Bachelor pretending to shoot himself in the head. Man can't say ass or sex, but he can mime suicide. And why? And one day I confronted him about his recommendations. I complained that he was in an echo chamber of white men who didn't acknowledge patriarchy, white supremeness, or the privilege they, come, they receive from those systems. I couldn't get past the ignorance to receive the lessons of the book, I told him. She went full on DEI, white, white awful. And if you don't know the awful acronym, it's like affluent, white, uh, feminist, urban, liberal. She went awful on him. And she says, oh my gosh, he listened. His next book recommendations was from Emily Nagoski's Come As You Are. I was so excited that he was suggesting a patriarchy smashing author. The next thing he did was plan an entire date around the book. He owned the project of incorporating the information into our lives. And his emotional labor felt like love to me in a way my drawer full of bikinis didn't. As my audience is roughly 80% female, I'm pretty sure we all know about how women typically take on the household admin tasks. Appointments, holidays, dates, otherwise they won't get done or they won't happen. So I'm reading this as a man actually taking the initiative, the time, the attention to do something he knows his partner will like instead of expecting her to do it if she wants it to happen. He, he read and recommended the book and invited me to a scheduled date on my calendar, which might not sound sexy, but it feels like steaming hot con consent to me. He completed an accompanying worksheet, set up activities, and led the conversation to discover our most mutually pre uh, pleasing um, context in the bedroom, as the book recommends. That sounds great. Oh my gosh, this is so bad. Oh, right. But why is it so bad? Why is it bad to want to please your partner? We kept the practice of scheduling connection time so I get a chance to look ahead in my calendar and crave our date nights and their happy endings. Oh my God. So they schedule their dates and the woman looks forward to them. Why is that bad? Is it because the man is doing something she likes and wants? I'm not a queen or a goddess. I'm a person with a body and so is he. 
I honestly don't understand this. Why is he mocking the statement that women aren't queens and goddesses? Isn't that what he teaches? That women are not above men? She turned him into a feminist. And you know what? He's behaving like a good boy. Is this man now a feminist because he treats his wife, and hopefully women in general, as a person and not a mysterious entity that he has to bribe into having sex with him and hope that he guesses the right bribe to grant him sex? Oh my goodness. He's, be he's behaving like a good boy. Good boy, you did your di you did the dishes. I'm gonna give you five minutes of happy time today. The woman just said he was doing things in the hopes of having sex. So obviously doing dishes in the hope of having sex wouldn't have fixed anything. It would just be the same behavior as before. Good boy, you mowed the lawn. You read the book I, I assigned you. She didn't assign the book. He selected it. He took the initiative. I think Bachelor is judging this man as himself. And since Bachelor would never do any of this, he's making assumptions on behalf of this man he doesn't know. And uh, you cooked dinner and you validated me by not, by not desiring me. And you scheduled intimate time on the calendar. Good boy. For that, I will allow you four minutes of starfish position and three minutes of from behind, but you must be done by then. No more than 10 minutes because I have my aromatherapy and my yoga class to go to. The article actually concludes with, co-creating a sexual context was fun and helped remind us that mutual pleasure is the only goal. Mutual pleasure, Bachelor. This might be a surprise, but women can enjoy and want sex. And I would bet most men would rather their partners enjoyed and wanted it instead of doing it out of obligation. Dude. This guy just, like, he just ended inside. You could hear. How? How did Bachelor hear this man end inside? And, and as a man, as a man, what choice does he have? Honestly, what choice does he have? A, no, I'm not doing this. Okay, divorced. The article also includes this line. Our cat and mouse dynamic was giving me anxiety and making him resentful. So why does Bachelor think this man was happy with the status quo and would rather have maintained it? I'm taking you for everything. If we have kids, I'm going to try to take the custody. I'm going to ruin you. I'm going to tell everybody you're poisonous and toxic and blah, 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 blah. So if divorce ruins men and benefits women, which is not true, see below, why wouldn't the author have just divorced him? Why would she go to therapy, read books, and try to work things out instead of just divorcing? Or you can do it. And if you want to, and if, because if you cheat on me, I'll also take you through the ringer. So you be a good little boy and I'll give you a little bit of bedroom fun. You just have to do what I want. And that's how this, that's how this guy just, his soul left his body. Or maybe he loved his wife and wanted to stay with her. Maybe he wanted to improve their relationship too. Maybe he wanted to model a healthy relationship for their kids. And now, and now he's another henpecked husband quietly slipping into the night. Why? Because his wife said something and instead of shutting her down, he agreed with her? Don't do it. Don't do it. That's why you don't get married. You don't get in your, into a place where a woman can flip on a dime because of some weird crap she saw at a protest or, or, or at a class in college in uni or something or other, and she can go, you don't do it. Don't do it. Walk, keep yourself to where you can walk away when somebody goes lunatic like this on you. This is his idea of someone going lunatic? And now she's happy and he's miserable. And again, you know that how? That was it for Bachelor's video. He ended by inviting viewers to movie night on his Locals channel and, well, I'm going to peek at the comments. Screw it. Let's call this sexual abuse and that she's a horrible wife. Drizzle, drizzle. I hope I'm misunderstanding. Please, someone tell me that declining sex isn't being called sexual abuse in this comment. Summary of video. Women describe the horror of a husband who is sexually attracted to them and will do anything to make them happy. There were no women in this article. It was one woman describing her experience with her husband. They all do this. I swear they can only love you for five to seven years max. Then you are repulsive to them. I'll do what? Go to therapy to improve their marriages? Did this person stick around to the end of the article? She totally misunderstand the situation. The problem is not his behavior. She simply lost any attraction for him. Ah, uh, yes. Random commenter on the internet who hasn't even read the article but had the article read to them by a biased second party definitely knows this woman's situation better than the woman herself. Feminism has removed love from relationships. 
That first man wasn't attractive to the woman. Therefore, his being nice gave her the ick out of her perceived expectation of repayment of physical intimacy. But she is perfectly fine having him provide financially without reciprocating. If she had been attracted to him, she would do things for him. He needs to leave. I would like to know what this person's definition of love is to claim that feminism has removed it from relationships. And no, he wasn't being nice. Giving someone something with the expectation of repayment isn't being nice. And if this person had been paying attention, they would have noticed that they have a healthy sex life at the end of the article. And where do they get the idea that the man is financially providing with nothing being reciprocated? I'm going to hope this person isn't suggesting that if a man is the sole or primary income earner, the woman owes him sex. But it says right on her author page that she's a relationship coach and was a lobbyist. So how was this helping men? I guess he was using this to illustrate to single men why they shouldn't get married because then they might find themselves going to therapy and reading books, but how is it helping? If anything, this sort of thing harms men. If the husband in question had reached out to Bachelor and said, my wife wants us to go to therapy and she thinks my books are too white male centric, Bachelor would have told him to say no, which wouldn't have solved anything and might have led to divorce. Which, incidentally, Bachelor thinks ruins men. I don't understand the appeal of this content, but I suspect it might just be about banding together against a perceived common enemy, women. Anyway, about my experiment, earlier this year I had an idea to do a video on if the Manosphere is a cult or not, and part of that idea was to do a video on some content from various Manosphere creators, which I haven't done in some time and gauge the response. For example, my 2021 Better Bachelor video was generally disliked by its fans, but my 2022 strong, successful male video got a lot more engagement. In fact, two years later, it still gets comments from his fans. I find this behavior fascinating, but I find the content painfully boring. So if you see anything you think might be of interest to me, please feel free to send it in. The submission form is linked below. And that's it for this video. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you in the next one. And no, if you become a ma'am,